Hello, everyone. I'm Cynthia Myers Morrison, Board of Trustees for Food Addiction Institute, and having a wonderful opportunity for you for the a webinar on the our food addiction recovery clinical study. Dr. Jen Unwin, Heidi Yivner, Yiver. You have to correct me and say it again. Uh, we'll introduce themselves. They're amazing women and researchers and people who have skill sets way beyond um, what they realize and how influential they are in this uh, project that has to do with food addiction. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and then uh, talk about this amazing addiction recovery clinical study. So which of you would like to start? Go ahead, Heidi. Okay, thank you. So my name is Heidi Yeavard, and you did very well, actually, Cynthia. My name is not that easy to pronounce. The reason I have this name is entirely my father's fault. He is Norwegian. I am Norwegian. Um, and, uh, and so that's where the name come from, comes from. Um, I currently work based in the United Kingdom. And um, my, my original, actually, my original degree is in chemical engineering. And I retrained in nutrition a number of years ago uh, in connection with a health scare that I, I had myself, uh, which is a little bit the background for why I'm, I'm working with food addiction, because uh, as I, in, in those days when I retrained, um, realizing that actually my, my challenges, my health challenges were due to food, but I didn't know of anything, anything along the lines of addiction-like symptoms with food, didn't even think about it. Um, so it's only in recent years um, that I then met uh, Dr. Jen Unwin, who has since become a very good friend and uh, as well as a colleague, and Bitten Jonsson, and we trained together. And of course, we trained together with you, Cynthia. So, um, and that's, that's maybe, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. So but delighted to be on this program with you, Cynthia. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here with us. And Dr. Jen. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Yes, so I'm a clinical psychologist by background. I'm also, I'm also allowed to call myself a health psychologist because I always worked in, with using psychology in physical health settings, people with chronic conditions. So that was my sort of professional background. Um, latterly, yeah, through sort of hearing bitten, I came to learn about food addiction and realized that that explained one heck of a lot of my own story. <laughs> so I thought, right, I need to go and find out about that. So that's how I got on the training course with, uh, with both of you. And it's been uh, quite the ride since then. Uh, so interesting, so much more to do, so much more to learn. Um, and yeah, so the, yeah, really one of the main things that I've been doing since finishing the training with Bitten is working with Heidi on this, uh, this, this project that we're trying to pull together. I hope that you will talk about the project and how and why it came about and mm -hmm. who's involved. Yeah, for sure. Shall I kick off, Heidi, and then you, yeah, you check it? Yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, I did the training with Bitten and then um, towards the back end of 2020, it would have been, um, I took a big look at all the literature. That's something that I, you know, I used to do when I, I often had jobs that were sort of half in academia and half in, half in the clinical space. So um, it, it was, it's always in my head to try and find out what's already known and what's already been done and try to sort of do a bit of a synthesis of that. Um, I think what's happened in the food addiction space is a lot of people are clinicians with their own lived experience who've then gone on and you know done food addiction training or they've you know they've got coach training and that's all brilliant there's hundreds of people out there now helping people on the ground um but what we haven't got so much is um that sort of academic piece um partly because as we all know it's not a recognized condition <laughs> in the dsm or the icd so there isn't that research funding so I went and had, had a look and there is a lot of papers which um, basically agree with the thesis that food addiction is, food sugar addiction is, is a real condition. There's evidence for it. The symptoms map on to other 
um, addictions like drug addiction and alcohol addiction, uh, the symptoms are sort of basic, basically the same. But what we haven't got, the, the, the sort of aching gap, if you like, is have we got any evidence of um, how to help people? So there are a lot of people out there helping people. And I, I do believe they're doing effective things, but we haven't got the data to back that up. And we haven't got the data to say, well, this particular approach will get you this particular result, which of course is what you want in healthcare. You want to know that if I do this thing to a person with this condition, on average, this is going to happen. And then you can say to, um, you know, there's, there's more chance of someone having some informed consent. So we could then, you know, the program that we're doing in the future, we'll be able to say of all the people that go through this program, this many people have this much benefit. Uh, one or two maybe don't do so well, but then people are going into it with their eyes open. So there's, there's very, very little data out there in the literature. Some of that is because obviously some of the, some of the interventions are 12 step interventions and they wouldn't, they wouldn't collect data because they're <laughs> anonymous by, you know, by just by the very nature of the thing. Um, so they, they don't collect data. And yeah, the clinic, clinics haven't on the whole been collecting data. So that's the, that's the background to it, that we need to be able to show efficacy of the kind of approach that Bitten was teaching us uh, in our training. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and if, do you want me to add a little bit to that, Cynthia? Um, so, so in addition to that, because of Jen's great work looking at the research, then we also had an opportunity to, um, to start thinking about, well, we, we, need, we, we can see that we need some, some clinical experience of what works and what doesn't, and we need data. And so we need to do it in a, in, in a form that's not, not where people are, are actually, they're anonymized. But but we are we have a have a, a, a structure and a methodology that allows us to to do this data collection, but also we want to try and um, uh, use that to back up our our intention to try and get food addiction recognised as as a disease. So because of what we what we know what we what we learn both in terms of our own. Um, experiences of food addiction, but also with the work that we've done with experts like like Bitten, um, is that that there is there are so many parallels, and we need this to be recognised so that we can um, deliver um, a better treatment than than what people are getting today, because what they're getting today isn't isn't working. So, but in order to, it becomes a bit of a chicken and egg situation because the, when, we, when we try to get the disease recognized with people like the um, WHO in their inter international classification of disease, ICD, um, then of course they are looking for cl clinical evidence. They're saying, so, okay, so you say it's, it's different to eating disorders or something like that, but, but do you have anything that shows that if you have a, a treatment program that is different to an eating disorders program, um, that it gives better outcomes. So, yeah. so it ties these things together for us and makes it another reason why it's important for us to do that. Um, and, and just one more more thing to, uh, added to that, because as Jen says, there are so many, there are people doing some wonderful work out there with really good intentions of just trying to help people with this this dreadful, um, all-encompassing disease that affects our daily lives, um, there are no standards for what, what's acceptable treatment and, and what's not. So we also need to bring this to a level where, where we can set standards um, for, for future tr treatment programmes. Yeah. Heidi makes a brilliant point about um... You know, we were saying there are lots of people out there doing this treatment, but of course, in the in the UK, most people don't go for private treatment or private approaches. They would go to their general practitioner and they would be referred somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but at, at the moment in the UK, there's absolutely nowhere for you to be referred. And the vast majority of people can't afford private treatment. Even if they could, they probably wouldn't find 
they'd be lucky to find a, a practitioner who was who was offering something. So they either get referred to mental health services, and mental health services don't know anything about food addiction, or and they would get trend, treated for a sort of mental health condition, might get put on medication for etc. Or they'll get they might get referred to an eating disorder service if if they were lucky because those places are very uh, hard to come by. Uh, but most eating disorder service services don't believe or understand about food addiction and would try and go with a sort of moderation model. Um, or the third option is that you might get referred to addiction services, although I, it's unlikely, I think, that a GP would refer you to addiction services because they tend to focus on drugs and alcohol and, again, wouldn't know about the food piece. So um, that's the UK situation. There's just no help for anybody. They would just kind of go around the system and get, get mislabeled and, and the wrong kind of help. So. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a definite need for us to 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 learn from doing this kind of work and and gathering the data and then publishing it so other people can comment on it and they can you know they can do other studies as well. So, so who's involved and how are these participants recruited, screened? How do they get yeah. to participate? Lucky people they are. Great question. Great question. So. Originally, it was just going to be Heidi and I. Uh, we put together our group program because I, you know, I think when you're, you know, in the future when people are trying to help people at scale, groups are great anyway. But also, I think we would all agree that actually in food addiction work, groups have a very special, you know, there's, uh, and there's evidence for that. So there's papers that say that when you're trying to help people with eating problems or people with addiction, actually groups have this added benefit so go we decided to go with the group program and we put together the the sessions based on basically what we'd learned from bitten and what we felt you know as professionals so Hyde is a nutritionist and I'm a psychologist and we sort of put it all together um but then uh it occurred to us that there's other people in the space who are offering similar group programs more or less on the same basis who we could maybe recruit to the study so that it, there would be, you know, we could compare between different um, delivery teams, um, but also have more, more data. So we were so lucky really to, to be able to involve um, Charlotte and Frida from Leva Soccer Fry in Sweden, and Chrissy and Molly from North America, um, because they, they're both, um, teams working with group in group settings and we just had a, a lot of meetings sort of trying to work out what we could agree was our common protocol so that that was the that was the challenge that we sort of had our protocol but then we had to see if if everybody's was close enough um and we really feel it you know we were able to do that it was close enough in terms of the number of sessions we were offering well how we were going to recruit people uh, the number of sessions we were offering the themes that those sessions would would cover and then how long a follow up so basically people get uh about 10 about 10 to sessions is it 10 to 14 sessions uh, we do ours mostly weekly with the occasional gap and then they're getting follow up once a month um for two years because another problem with studies like this is that they they just don't go on long enough yeah, so you 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 get, you know, people collect data before the group and at the end of the group and they go, oh, yes, we did this marvellous group. It's so effective. Uh, but we all know that just taking part in something is going to make a difference. And because we haven't got a control group, what we needed to do was really follow up people for a good length of time to see that, that what's uh, see what's working. Um, so that's who's involved. I don't know if Heidi, wants, you do want to talk about how we recruit people. Yeah, so so um, what we what we decided to do, of course, because there is no formal diagnosis of food addiction, it's, it's self-diagnosed food addicts. Um, and we, so, so that's, that's our starting point. We, we've, um, Jen is, as you know, Jen is, is a dynamo on social media. So, so um, she's advertised it that way, but, um, you know, we, through various connections, we've also talked to, to colleagues in the, um, uh, in, in various primary care practices and that kind of thing. And just, just put the information out there who would like to, to join this clinical study. 
Um, so it's all, all people who self, self um, diagnose as food addicts and want to be part of the study. So of course they have to, they, they themselves then have to be willing to share their data. They have to be willing to, they're taking a place on the study. So we, we try to impress upon them that we really do need them to be involved for a two year period, recognizing of course that, that um, that's not always possible. So we will have, have dropouts. Um, but yeah, so we've, we, the way we, we've recruited, because, because the other, other part of it is also what, what size of groups can we cope with? So um, we've, we've said between us, and that's also part of our protocol agreed with the other, the other two teams, the North America team and, and Sweden based team, is that we will, we will have um, groups that are that we can manage on online so everything is done online um and uh so our groups jen's and my groups are have been down to to sort of six eight people but up to 14 people so the groups that we're running at the moment are we have 14 people in in each group and so we've split them up and we so we started um we're now on groups four and five um and we, we uh, at this point, I think, Jen, we have about 70 people that we've that have actually come forward to be recruited, which is absolutely hugely exciting because our mm. aim is to have 25. Um, but end. 25 at the end. <laughs> we need 25 at the end. So we've so, so 70, 70 people have actually started the, the group, the group in groups one to five. So We've got plenty of people. We just need to keep them, keep them in there, and ob obviously their their data is anon anon anonymous. They they know that it can't be linked back to them by anybody. So um, we well we know who they are, but that you know nobody else would know when they were looking at the data. Um, so they yeah. get and they sorry sorry go ahead Jen. I was just going to say they get assessed before the group at the end of the group, which is about twelve weeks. Uh, and then every six months up to up to two years. So we've got before and after now for groups one, two and three, which is about 33, 34 people uh, so far. So um, we've got a nice little bit of data to to already look at. Yeah. And I was just going to add, Cynthia, on the, the question of of recruitment, um, these people, we also um, do go through a proper formal interview um, mm -hmm. process. So we, we have the methodology for that, that we've also agreed between the, the three teams so that we're recruiting people on the same basis, um, and same understanding and same commitment. Um, and of course, there we try to look at whether there are any, any medical conditions that, or, or any other conditions that that person themselves feels could preclude them from being involved in a study or that their health professional would and we encourage everybody to to make sure that their health professional is aware that they are um that they're joining joining the study um and that they will very likely be making changes to their to what they what they eat um we hope um, and also, therefore, of course, to check whether they they're on any any kind of medication that would would uh, that needs looking at or would preclude them in any way. Yeah. So, what kind of data are, are you collecting? Um, does it include other eating disorders, things of that as well? So um, we so there's a few sort of obviously um, things like. We, height and weight and waist and HBA wants to see if they know it. So how sugar is their blood? If they know it because a few people do, but we don't. We don't insist on people getting blood tests or anything. Um, and then the YFAS, obviously, uh, I know some people don't love it as a clinical tool, but we thought well we'll include it because so much, so many of the published papers have the the YFAS uh, data in. It's a good comparator if nothing else. And then um, we've developed a screen. Um, from the six criteria in, in ICD, um, the six criteria for substance use disorder. And we just have taken the wording for those. Um, uh, so people uh, fill in that. And then 
the out the outcome that we're really interested in is that is mental well-being really because that's in a way that's the thing that suffers isn't it it's not always about it isn't always about weight and it shouldn't always be about weight but the, the one thing that people have in common who have uh, food addiction struggles is that their their mental well-being suffers so we've got a the Warwick Edinburgh mental well-being scale um as really I suppose that's really the key outcome for us well we want the food addiction symptoms to lessen and we want the mental well-being to to improve over time um yeah so those are the main things could you share the six criteria from the ICD um they're a little bit different than the substance use yeah, disorder um, that are 11 in the uh, uh, DSM. the way the way that we mem- remember it is with the uh the acronym craved okay so c uh, heidi's going to help me out here because i probably won't remember them all c is for compulsion yeah so that's the idea that you have urges that uh, you, you know despite your best intentions you you can't resist to consume certain foods or your your drug foods uh r is reaching for more so that's the sort of tolerance tolerance effect that we've already experienced where over time, we need more and more of the substance to get the same effect. Yeah, we're all nodding. Um, uh, a, a is activities neglected, uh, which captures this uh, phenomenon in addiction where over time you get so obsessed with, with the object of your <laughs> addiction that you start um, letting go of other activities that used to bring pleasure in your life or things like... Um, connection to family or your work suffers so all of these other things sort of fade into the background as the obsession grows v is for volume oh, i'm doing quite well actually <laughs> v is for volume, which is needing uh, thinking that you're just gonna have um a little bit you know like i just have the, that one biscuit and you eat the whole packet Vol- so v is for volume more than you intended uh the e is for exclusion yeah and that means that captures the withdrawal symptoms so um if you exclude those foods from your diet you start to experience withdrawal symptoms and then we have the 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 traditional list of withdrawal symptoms anxiety gastrointestinal symptoms headaches shakiness all of that uh and d oh d is my favorite really and d is continued use despite damage so um even when we know it's doing us mental and physical harm we we can't we can't stop we we continue to use despite the knowledge that it's doing us harm or despite the concerns of our family and friends that it's doing us harm we 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 carry on using so so that's craved and obviously it does help you remember the six criteria because i've remembered them (laughs) outstanding i was thinking the d was going to be denial which essentially it it is it's that it idea is. of you know not me yeah. i'm not one yeah. of those <laughs> i'm carrying on despite everything yeah i'm carrying on right absolutely yeah yeah and, and oh, the reason fabulous it, it makes it, it it's a simple it's only those six questions um and uh when we we work with the the, the groups on them to to sort of have a relook at that during the sessions to try and and understand um, if they have scored as food addicts, which you won't be surprised, they all do. They all did. Uh, uh, so that's learning number one from the whole study, really, sorry to interrupt, is that people are really good at, te- at really knowing if, they're, if they've got a food addiction. We haven't had anybody who says, I'm a food addict, that we didn't think was. <laughs> or maybe yeah, one lady we didn't screen in uh, who, who we thought hadn't, but she was desperate to find some help. So she just thought she'll talk to us because we might be able to help so sorry Heidi I interrupted you no no and I was just going to say just two two more aspects to it because we really do like this tool don't we and one of our one of our reasons for doing it was that we wanted to have something very simple that clinicians can use um in a in a 10 minute appointment type thing yeah because we love sugar obviously we trained to do sugar as you did and I think for those in-depth coaching you know when you're going to be working one-to-one with someone obviously you get a fantastically deep (laughs) amount of information but we're we're sort of along the lines of there's so many millions of people that we're going to have to try and help not 
we, look, we can't do a sugar for everybody. So how can we do, and how can people get screened in a clinic? So we could easily teach doctors to do this. And in fact, there is a doctor who's, uh, who's adopted it in, in his clinic as those six simple questions just to screen uh, yeah. type of diabetics. It's basically yes, no question. So it's so you don't need any anything, anything else other than that questionnaire. But the way we use it within the sessions with people as well, which you'll be able to relate to Cynthia, is that is that um, to we we also help people to to or, or encourage people to say, well, when when is the first time this happened and has it and when is it still happening or or is it now in your past, in which case, how old were you? So, so taking that learning from sugar um, yeah. that Bitten did with us, just to help us, to help people to establish in that very simple six ICD-10 um, related um, questionnaire, how established is my addiction? Give myself a little bit of respect for the fact that I've actually been embedding this addiction for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, years um and and um so so we use that as a as a bit of a therapeutic um part of our sessions as well that's fantastic i i'd like to interject that i heard judith beck speak many years ago and she was talking about how she works with cognitive behavioral therapy with people who have eating disorders it, before she spoke about anything else. She said, if you have cravings, what I am going to say does not apply. Mm. Because she was saying, if you have cravings, my interpretation, you were a food addict and mm -hmm. all of these cognitive behavioral things, while they may be helpful, they tend to be in a moderation treatment Whereas yes. you need something else, which would be closer to the abstinence treatment that has been successful with drugs, alcohol, uh, mm -hmm. cigarettes, nicotine, so that whole area. So good, good yeah, yeah, really brilliant. The, the other question then in terms of your treatment protocol, what do you do during these different sessions and subsequent in the, subsequently in the follow-up? Because you have some groups that are already there. So exciting. Yes, it, is, it is exciting. We're learning so much, as you can imagine. So there's basically sort of eight, eight steps to the, to the, to the protocol. Um, and we, we use each session, which is about an hour and a half long, to usually do a little bit of teaching around the, around the topic. Um, but then we get people to, uh, obviously we're encouraging people to, to interact so they would give us their reflections on the topic. And we always ask at the end of one session, you know, what small, what from what you've learned or where you're up to now, what one small thing are you going to focus on until we meet next time and, you know, come back and tell us about it. So there's always that bit of continuity and there's always that idea that, you know, to, to, to get somewhere different, they're going to have to try different things and try and do something differently and see how that affects them. Because we're, we're not really about telling people do this or do that we want them to absorb the information we give them and then apply it to themselves and to come up with their own their own abstinent food plan we don't say you know eat this at this o'clock and this at this o'clock <laughs> uh, it's more or less don't eat this but you know then organize it as as, as suits for you um, and we give people home studies um based on what they've learned they, they go away and uh, and do some reflections about it and come back and talk about it the, the following week so it's it's a combination of sort of a, a bit of didactic and then quite a lot a lot of interaction and and, and that's that, yeah the, the the so the starting point actually of each session is exactly that bit the general was just talking about this the the what what did i learn from the previous session that's going to be applicable to me and how do I want to use it and what does how does that work in my life you know let's make this practical and real for me um, and then so that the the starting point of each session is and what did you notice what where where are you at and what's really what's very nice in these last couple of groups that we've been doing because the group is so big now is that we we 
put people in in smaller breakout rooms and then to 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 try and make sure that everybody has a chance to say something as jen said we're it's, we're only doing an hour and a half so that's a that's a sh quite a short time to allow people to talk and explore and share their their perspective mm -hmm. challenges and also get some teaching time so yeah. um so, i don't know if we can we remember the eight the eight in in the correct order we start with some sort of addiction concepts and we sort of introduced them to the idea of as 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 food uh, as food as addictive and then uh we've just done week two we kind of have two two parts to it don't we we do the, the sort of conceptual all the all the concept the the addiction concepts the self-assessment um the kind of building the toolbox in in the first few first few sessions and then part two we start actually practicing them so we start using those tools and building then building you know how do i now after i've learned about all these different concepts um and and tools that i could use how do i now start to change my habits and tastes how do i now start to to work on scenarios where I am triggered, real life ex examples of my, my trigger situations and, and challenges. What, um, what am I going to practice now to, to try and, and deal with that in a different way to the way I've either dealt with it in the past that hasn't worked, or as you were saying, um, Cynthia, where I've been in denial and, and therefore haven't even been prepared to to think about it or, or or do anything about it so it's kind of that's that two-step approach and then we we end with the with a what we what we call our graduation um where those who have attended a certain number of sessions this is a clinical study so we have to be recording when how how many sessions people are attending and whether they're doing the home studies and then um they graduate at the end of that um that 10 effectively 10 session program and they can then join the support programs that are monthly and one of the one of the things that we've realized in the process uh, is that we a lot of because it's quite a quick 10 10 sessions is it, it's no time at all is it it's it can be it's a lot of very it's a very intensive um period so then the support sessions, we want to go over the material as they see fit, as, as the group would like, as the group sees is important, things that they want to, to cover again um, and practice. So in mm -hmm. essence, that's about it, isn't it, Jen? Is there something I missed yeah. there? Yeah, yeah. And um, each group actually has, has set up their own WhatsApp support so uh, group. So... Um, They've all they've all got that that now. So we we're not in those, but we do know that they interact and people say that they're very useful. So they message each other if they're having a wobble or, you know, they send each other resources and that kind of thing. And then what we've said to them is if there's anything in the if there's any question in, in the group that you can't answer, do ask us. Or if you're worried about somebody, we had one situation where the rest of the group were a bit worried about one person and you know that they really wanted to contact us because they they felt that we ought to know so we've, we've said that's fine you know we, we don't want to be in the group because we'll just be drowning in messages but um we're really happy to get involved if, if we're needed um the people that we've had that have struggled and we've had one or two dropouts it's where there's just so much else going on in their lives as happens you know when you have a group of 70 people you're going to have some that are going through a divorce or a bereavement and um we've just had one or two that have really not managed to to stay the course we've actually had one or two from the earlier groups who only managed to do one or two sessions who've asked to come into to these current groups so that's that's been nice they still wanted to do it just wasn't the right time uh originally so we try and be accommodating as you would be in a clinical setting you know we're not we're not trying to be super strict this isn't a sort of randomized control trial this is a, a real world you know does it work in the real world kind of study not not a control every single variable which you can't anyway it's just uh, the main question is can, doing what we do can we actually help on average <laughs> can we 
on average help people to improve their mental well-being and reduce the number of food addiction symptoms that they're experiencing on on and the basis can be, and can that be maintained yeah. yeah on the basis of that particular structure of of the if you like to call it an intervention but uh, maybe that's also the point to add one more thing Cynthia you might be interested in which is the that we um we are also not directly as part of this clinical study but very but closely associated with it um running intensive weekend programs where we are using actually the same same structure and material but making it even more intensive so taking those those um those 10 sessions and putting them into literally a long weekend yes yes um, poor souls <laughs> but what you poor souls but actually the uh, the reality of the experience is that that has been that has been actually quite a a, a very um an extremely positive experience um, it, thinking now what you were saying jen about we're trying to make something real realistic something that's going to work in a, in 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 future health life um and so what the opportunity with that is that um people are so enthused about joining that as well that they are saying if you need to use our data um, my data to compare with the clinical study then absolutely do it we want to help contribute to it so so that's a a, a really nice outcome that's that's happening there so we'll, we'll have in addition to our study these this program that we can say you know can we see and can we take out of that? Does, it, does it work any better or worse if you and of course what's lovely with that is that we actually get to meet people in person and and that that brings a whole new <laughs> level of joy to the work uh we really had a fantastic time in the first the first one we did um and yeah, just being able to connect to people and hear their stories face to face is, is absolutely fantastic. That, all of this is so exciting, just thrilling. Well, a few more questions. So what is the follow-up protocol? You said monthly, and mm -hmm. are they still hour and a half sessions? And you mentioned uh, that they choose more what they want to focus on. Yeah, I think I think we do an hour, don't we? And yeah, um, it's every month for two years. And knowing us, we'll carry on doing them. Um, they 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 choose what they want to focus on, but it is a, it is a lot more free flowing, more coaching, more them interacting with each other and giving each other suggestions and, and support and so on. It's uh, it's not it's definitely not as structured as the uh, as the session sessions. But we, I suppose, we just do Heidi just does her thing and I just do my thing. <laughs> Also, I think what, what we've learned out of this was that they actually do like a little bit of structure. So they want, they, they want, want a little bit. Yeah. So one of the things that we've, we've agreed with them, which we didn't start out doing was to give them a home study between those, between those monthly sessions. So, so it, you know, it's a little bit in our human nature, isn't it? That accountability thing that, you know, give me a deadline, give me, give me some accountability and I'm more likely to, to do it. So <laughs> So uh, that has come from them, not from not from us at all. They asked for it. So, so, uh, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, your initial findings—you've mentioned a few things. What in the groups that are already into the well into this two-year period now? They're moving in. What are, what are the initial findings of your your studies? <laughs> well it does look like so we've got the before the group and the after the group so as i say you know you you'd, you'd expect really people to feel better after any kind of group intervention that you'd find that in most research it does seem to be the case so so the well-being scores are definitely significantly better and the crave scores are definitely significantly lower uh interesting about the yfas so we'll be saying more at the food addiction conference on the 20th of may i don't think we've i've quite digested the the yfas data yet um but it looks like our main our main outcomes are going in the, the way that we would have wished at this point but as i say more, more and on because each six months we'll be gathering data and seeing whether people are maintaining that that benefit and and i guess our expectations on the YFAS isn't that we're going to see big outcomes in the first first six months 
either, where we, we would expect to see more out, outcomes maybe after the, at the end of the two year intervention. Yeah. And when and where can we hear the date, data presented? You mentioned yes. the May event, would you say a, a couple more words? Cause there's still, there are people yeah. who will hear this before the May event. Yes. Come on people. So May the 20th, uh, we've got a one day conference in Bristol in the UK uh, with keynote speakers, uh, Bitten Johnson and Paul Early from the American Society of Addiction Medicine. But also loads of other really good speakers. Dave Avram Wolf will pre be presenting um, this, where we're up to. So all three, you know, the, Sw the Swedish team and the American team and, uh, and we'll all be there uh, talking about where, where we're up to so far. And also, if there's any food addiction professionals listening, on the Thursday afternoon, uh, May the 19th, there's a food addiction professionals meetup to talk about starting an association and various other topics. And also just that chance, as I say, that magical chance to meet up in person. Um, I've never met Bitten, and yet I feel like I really know her. <laughs> so, um, And Heidi and I either, hardly ever see each other in person. So it'll be... Uh, It'll be really, really lovely to see people in person. So, yeah, I hope, uh, you know, definitely if people are listening in the UK, please, please try and come or maybe in, in, even in Europe. And there are quite a few of the Americans coming over. Uh, Molly, Chrissy, Dave Avram Wolf. Um, well, Jane Steele will be here. She actually lives in the UK at the moment, but she's from Canada, obviously. Uh, yes, there's quite, quite, a, quite a few people traveling and coming over. And can Fantastic. we add, mm -hmm. since, sorry, may we add, but of course, following on from that is the Public Health Collaboration Conference, the two day event on the Saturday, so the, on the 21st and the Sunday, the 22nd. So, so if yeah. anybody is thinking of coming over, um, there's, it's not, it's, yes, please, please, please join the, the Food Addiction Day on the Friday, the 20th, and the professionals meeting the day before, but also join the rest of it as well. There's some great speakers, um, on on yes the 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 next days in fact should we i don't know fact, the, saturday, the saturday has a theme of addiction so paul early is talking again uh, another lecture and there's other speakers who are talking about public health aspects of addiction related to nutrition and and, and those sorts of issues and then there are still i think a couple of places left for bitten's intensive 15th to the 18th of may so this is before all of the, what we've just been talking about but also in Bristol. Um, so it, yes, even if you're coming from abroad, it is worth coming for a, a full week of events. It's quite rare to get the opportunity to do four days with Bitten. Um, and for those who have done it before, I have heard it is quite the life transforming event. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think there are a couple of places. And for that, you need to go to Bitten's website, uh, bittensaddiction.com, and she'll send you the details if there are any places left. And for the and other... Well, the other one, you need to go to the phcuk.org website. Correct. And these are all places that you can go, even if you're listening to this after the May events, you are welcome to go to the phcuk.org place, website. right? To get additional yeah. information about that, about Bitten's addiction, and yeah. um, Frida and... Um, Charlotte have have uh, FAI YouTube things also, so there are many opportunities. And I've recently interviewed Jen and also David Unwin, the GP with whom she's married, and um, on their respective issue, issues and descriptions of things that they've been doing. So those will be posted soon on Food Addiction Institute. So if you haven't seen those, those are outstanding ones to, to talk about and look at. Um, so many exciting things that are going on here. I, I just want to ask a couple more questions. Do you have a, like two more minutes? Two more minutes, yes? yeah. Okay. One question, and you can choose to answer or not, but one question in terms of abstinence, what does that mean or not mean, or is it used or not used? Um, and also the eating disorders, what you've seen in terms of um, comorbidity, or are they on a spectrum continuum, or is this 
for a future question in a future interview. <laughs> Thank you. Funnily enough, funnily enough, we've just been talking about that. It's fascinating, the whole eating disorder, food addiction overlap. I think they're so closely related, if not the same thing. That, that's, that's kind of my view. I don't think there's many people with food addiction that don't have symptoms of eating disorders, whether they'd actually be diagnosed as one or the other. But I think over time, and certainly this is my experience, that you, you have some or other of, of the symptoms of eating disorders. And I think um, also if you've got uh, an eating disorder, you have some or other of the symptoms of, of, of food addiction often. Um, in terms of abstinence, what would I say? Yes, we definitely talk about abstinence. And but we encourage people to to define abstinence from their own drug foods for them. What is it that you personally can't moderate? So I'm a person a bit like Judy Wolf, who who can't really have cheese or, or nuts or, you know, alcohol or many, many things. So I have to be really quite careful what what I have. So my to be abstinent I'm I'm sort of pretty clean eating but I know that other people can do a bit of cheese and they can but that's their own that's their own definition of abstinence so it's definitely sugar grains and ultra processed foods um but but then we say to you know there may be these some other things for you some other foods but that's how do you react to them and which things can't you moderate yeah. so if I if I you want a little bit um, from my perspective I completely as Jen said we were just we were discussing this earlier and and I I some I do struggle sometimes with the, with this our um, tendency to want to book, box people into you are either something or something else and I'm I'm very much um, of the opinion that that we see spectrums um, uh, everywhere and my I think the, the only additional point to make to what to Jen's point is the is the fact that what's unhelpful at the moment is that um, we don't have the the abstinence treatments as an option in in mm. ordered eating and because that is so 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 important with addiction which we know from other addictions um, yeah. that's the problematic side so so somehow we need to have enough distinction or enough understanding between the, the field of addiction and eating disorders in order to recognize that because other, until we do that we can't help people with food addiction. I really agree and it's that issue of choice as well isn't it you know that it was the same really when David and I started working with people with type 2 diabetes there was only there was only the choice of medication really or lose weight in the traditional way um, there wasn't the choice of low carb keto and everybody said, oh, it's not safe. And, and that's been our work is really to prove that it's a valid choice. It works. Lots of people can sustain it and feel amazing. And people should be given that choice. It's an evidence based choice. And I, I suppose that's where we're going with this. It's quite right, Heidi. You've kind of yeah. crystallized my thinking that that actually in eating disorders and food addiction, there hasn't been a, a, a choice of, of the abstinence model up to now because people say, Oh, that you know, it's not sustainable. It's not safe in the same way that they did with 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 low carb. So I suppose what we're trying to show with our project is that that the sort of um, the abstinence model with support is a is a valid option and should be given as a choice for people in clinics because there's no reason why healthcare professionals can't learn to do what we do. Yeah, no reason at all. No, absolutely not. And and also just one final point on the on that um, providing choice, even within the abstinence model, we provide choice because yeah. we say in a, and this is one of our one of our sessions where we talk about, OK, we've understood the, the concept of abstinence, why abstinence is important because of of having to get off this this treading this path in our brain reward circuitry that just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper until we get off the path and, and abstain from these foods that are causing us problems. But how do we do that practically? And this is where we say, you know, changing our habits and tastes can be one of the practical smaller steps rather than going top cold turkey today. 
So, so we give people a choice and we discuss that, that option. Both end up in abstinence, mm -hmm. but with some people, it is possible to take that to, and to uh, certainly to offer them the choice to say, well, maybe, yeah. maybe that I can actually, that I can over time actually learn to dislike or learn to drop as a habit. Mm -hmm. People know themselves best. We don't. We don't know what people are capable of, or what's going to suit them best, or what we've all. We all three will have different abstinences <laughs> and different recoveries, and really, we're just guiding people towards their own, their own solution. That that sort of solution focused idea that you know there are different solutions for for different people. There are some common things that we can teach people, but they have to find a way to their best solution. Mm -hmm. We don't. We don't know what that is. We can't predict what that is. One of the things that uh, DEFANG, the D-E-F-A-N-G process that David Wiss and Tim Brewerton have proposed to look at where people are in terms of uh, restriction or compulsive over consumption, um, those kinds of things. I It's a brilliant uh, piece of research and model and is limited only by, and I said this to him too, um, that is only limited by the fact that he hasn't included family of origin and that that piece to look at what did my, my previous generations have difficulties with? Because sometimes I may not be having that difficulty right now, but if I look at a longer vision, it may be useful in terms of diagnosis and choices of care. The other one more present for me, at least, is the process of aging and that over 23 years of abstinence from grains and sugar, I see a difference in what I can or cannot continue to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. And that's kind of surprising, isn't it? That, that this changes over time. It's really true. Yeah. When you look back and you think, oh, I used to be able to moderate whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. It's not, yeah. It's not working now. So we have to adapt and we have to be, it's a lifelong. And that's yeah. what we try to teach people as well. You know, this isn't, this isn't, this is a lifelong thing. Sorry, guys. <laughs> It isn't one and done. And when, when one other bit that you may not be aware of, but there was a 2018 um, set of interviews for Gray Sheeters Anonymous, G-R-E-Y-S-H-E-E-T-E-R-S -E 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 Anonymous. And that's a 12-step program with no grain, no sugar, and weighed and measured at specific times. It's very structured, very structured. So they often say the last house on the block. So if you've gotten to there, there probably isn't anywhere else to go. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, in that group of about um, over 800, close to 900 people they, that were interviewed, they reported that if you had one year of abstinence from grains and sugar, that the median of the 800 plus people was 11 years of abstinence from grains and sugar. So, mm -hmm. you know, there is some evidence that by abstaining from that which you personally find addictive, that you can have long term recovery. And it takes yeah. a lot of work to maintain that kind of recovery. It isn't one and done either, <laughs> but no, that, really. that information is hopeful for, you know, for all of us it really is. Yeah. And food addiction um, in two of the other food, addi food addicts, anonymous and food addicts in recovery, they've been acquiring information too. So the, you know, the opportunities are out there if people can't get into these particular programs that people are talking about right here, right now. You don't have a doctor that supports you in the ways that you'd like to be supported. There are 12-step programs and um, lots of them that offer the opportunities to get help. So for mm -hmm. this. And we are just so excited that you're doing this. So please keep us surprised. Please come back and, and share more information in the future. Do you have any last words that you'd like to share or any personal insights? Anything? 
Oh, it's just been lo it's lovely to talk about it. And, you know, even as you even as we get together to have this kind of discussion, you, you know, you're you're thinking of, uh, yeah, these connections and, um, you know, the work that that still needs to be done. So, yeah, we need to keep it together as as as, a, as groups of professionals and and clients and, you know, just just keep pushing forwards. Yeah. And and I think I think what we are trying trying to do here and what the programs that you've just been talking about as well, Cynthia, um, if we can keep sharing ideas um, and being focused on the on the fact that actually there is a growing number of food addicts because of this this environment we live in of these hyper palatable foods all around us available at all times of day and night what we need to focus our attention on is helping people to develop their own resilience and their own toolbox, their own solutions that are gonna work for them. Um, mm -hmm. Because we're never going to get to a situation or not, not certainly not in my, my life, our lifetimes, um, where there's going to be enough um, treatment programs for everybody forever. Um, they're going to be programs that people can drop into and, and out of and treatment and help and but but at the end of the day we have to do it for ourselves um and so yeah sharing brilliant what you're doing with this cynthia thank you for for inviting us to talk to you um let's continue doing it oh please please continue your brilliant work and sharing it with the public and sharing it in these varieties of ways I'm just thrilled to have been able to have this opportunity with the two of you. It's very meaningful for me, uh, personally and professionally. And I thank all of our uh, viewers for Food Addiction Institute. And please go to our foodaddictioninstitute.org site online, as well as all of our YouTubes. You will find much uh, broad resource base, lots of information and suggestions for you to incorporate in your own toolboxes. So um, we also have a donation button on Food Addiction Institute, and please share what you can, small or large, we're delighted to receive. So Heidi, Jen, what a pleasure to be with you this morning. I'm just uplifted uh, by all of the things you have shared. So thank you, and we'll see you again, um, and best wishes for May, and hoping that everything goes splendidly, and that you'll come back and share outcomes as they proceed. So thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.